Welcome to Drinking Bros, presented by GhostBed.com. Welcome to Drinking Bros. We always have like the craziest, most fascinating guests on the show. We've never had somebody who was actually pardoned by a president, Dan, I don't think. Right? Now, we've had a bunch of people that probably uh, need a pardon. <laughs> and I'm probably going to need one at some point as well. So. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, it, we'll there's see. no way this show makes it past the Biden administration. Yeah, for sure. One would think. Uh, no, but we've got uh, Gary Brugman on the show today. Welcome, um, my man. You were uh, in the press a lot for this um I was uh, yes. a, a few years ago. Um, coming just a tad closer there. There you go. There we go. For the ladies. <laughs> ladies need doing? to hear that voice, Gary. Girls. Yeah. Yeah. Um, man, you, you were recently pardoned by President Trump. Uh, we'll get into why uh, here in a moment. But um, the, the fascinating part about uh, your pardon was you were there the day that the, the Capitol insurrection happened. I sure was. I, I wasn't at the Capitol. I was actually in the White House waiting on the president. So did you, did you actually get to meet the president? I did not. Because of that insurrection that happened or, you know, the white, uh, Capitol breach. Yeah. I was in the White House waiting on him. Uh, I got invited to the White House and uh, I was getting a tour and I was sitting in a cabinet member's office. And um, then that happened. We heard that there was starting to be a breach. I was uh, in her office and. We walked to the Roosevelt room and I kind of got sat down there and he got taken to the situ situation room. No so shit. I never, I never got a chance to meet him. I uh, probably, if I was in the White House and stuff went sideways like that and everybody started going away, I'd probably find my way into the Lincoln bedroom to pound off or something, right? Like you got to do something weird. You got to take advantage of that opportunity because how, yeah. how often are you going to be unescorted inside the White House? And not very often. I mean, you were in the Roosevelt Room. I was right? in the Roosevelt Room right next to uh, Teddy Roosevelt's Nobel Peace Prize, which you were just talking about. Mm. It was like right in front. Oh, sorry. Oh, right did in, any yeah. part of you think of like, all right, everybody's just storming the couch. Like now's the perfect time to steal something like this. Yeah. Just steal the painting, out of there. Take the painting off the wall. And shit. Yeah. No, they Nobody probably, would notice. They probably have like a lot of uh, the really nice art galleries. They have these weighted sensors. Like mm -hmm. if, and if the weight distribution changes at all, a fucking alarm goes off. I'm pretty sure the White House has that for the fucking 300 year old pictures they have well, inside there, right? I don't know. They'd have to. Do they? Way. The security in there is amazing because yeah. I had to put up my cell phone, uh -huh. and uh, they had the uh, the National Defense guy's office, and I walked in there, and they're like, "You don't have a cell phone on you because if you walk in here into this room with a cell phone, the sensors will go off." Yeah, yeah. No so, shit. Yeah, yeah. Every, everything. The amazing security everywhere. Wow, that's crazy. They have cell phone lockers when you walk in. Yeah. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. So what, what happens when the, the sensor goes off? Uh, uh, Secret Service will come have your ass, I would imagine. Really? Yeah. I well, know I mean, they're it, just going to come take your phone. I'm sure people make the mistake from time to time, but usually you don't want a lot. It's a silent alarm, too. It's not like the whole White House is blasting. Right. Well, I didn't know if it was like one of the that Marjorie Chicks things, like where it was a Jewish laser that comes down. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, God, kind of damn, eliminates dude. you and your phone. I don't, I'm not sure how that works. Um, shocking that she was stripped of all her powers. I should what? probably move to her district. 75% <laughs> of people voted for her. That means there's probably some potential future Mrs. Holloway's there, right? Yeah, it does. Yeah. A lot. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> A lot. Can't hear you, Bob. Yeah, after she got stripped. After yeah. she got stripped, they interviewed people from her district, and they were like, we love her, we support her fully, that's our girl. Like, where, we, where, we believe what she says. What district was it? Yeah. It's like North Georgia, that's all I know. Like Stone Mountain? <laughs> yeah. Because Stone Mountain, you know Stone Mountain is like the fucking, the Confederate version of, of the Mount of Rushmore. Mount Rushmore. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, so grew, I grew up It's there. like, hey, we fucking lost. Let's, man, let's build a statue, man. Hell yeah. Yeah. Um, like, and if you really want to go down the, the stereotype rabbit hole there, they used to have a laser show on Friday nights against Stone Mountain oh, boy. to Leonard Skinner. So, I mean, it was everything you could hope for if went you, down there. If you want to go on YouTube and look that up, don't instead look up the Squidbillies portrayal it's of it. It's funnier. Yeah. yeah, it is. It's way better. <laughs> yeah, it's it's way funnier. He's talking about Awesome Bill from Dawsonville, which, of course, is uh, is uh, Bill Elliott Dawsonville, from Dawsonville, Georgia. Dawsonville, Georgia. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Big fan of Dawsonville and all the, all the fine folks that are living there. Yeah, big fan of uh, a lot of carpet. too. Yeah. A lot of carpet up in Dawsonville. Um, but for, for you personally, that day, um, when the president bounces, everything's kind of under lockdown. Was there a part of you that was like, ah, oh, shit, man, I'm probably not going to get this pardon now. No, I had already got the pardon. Oh, you did? I had already got the pardon. I got the pardon on, uh, the, uh, the day before Christmas Eve. No shit. I, yes. so, and, and the reason I ask, I, I was always curious how that works. Like just reading it in the media, you assume like you get the pardon and it's, it's right then and there. It's done. Uh, it's done. Yeah. But, um. 
when you get it on a, a Christmas Eve, were you in prison and they, and they just let you out? Oh no, I've I've been out of prison since two thousand six. Two thousand six? No yes. shit. Yes, but if you w- happen to be in prison, yeah, uh, they wouldn't let you out immediately. It would take at at least a week or so for the paper the process. Right, but yeah. yeah. But all your rights would be reinstated as of that day that he signed it. Which means you can own a gun now. I again. can. Yeah, it's nice. Did no they give you, shit. do you get like a Rudis? A Rudis is that wooden sword that uh, ex-slaves used to get out of the gladiator pits. Like if you won your freedom, you get a Rudis. You have to carry it around for the rest of your life. Do you have to carry some shit around or what? Uh, no, I have a, I actually got a letter from the pardon attorney, which uh, I usually carry a copy of in my truck. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I was going to bring it and I forgot because I didn't come in my truck. But uh I got a, uh, a certificate from the pardon attorney because the original one that the president signs, I wanted, but they, it's part of the presidential archives. They keep that, and it goes to the presidential archives. So the pardon attorney actually gives me the certificate reinstating all my uh, uh, firearms disabilities and, and uh, civil rights. I can vote now. I can run for office. I'm going to run for sheriff. Hopefully mm-hmm. one day we'll see. Really? I'm, I don't know. It's part of my plan. But yeah, because, I mean, dude, again— I guess this is how that, na- that is, naive that's I am one about presidential I would, pardons. I, that's one office I would run for, by the sheriff? way, sheriff. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't run for any other political office. Huh. Uh, I, I Again, being naive to the, the whole pardon situation, which is why I wanted to have you on. Whenever you hear presidential pardon, and I, I hate to lump you into this category, but oh, you, know, you hear fucking Kodak Black, Lil Wayne, all these guys. Yeah, you can't even like, rap, dude. Get out of here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, but, but I mean, like Kodak Black was in jail. So I, I figured, all right, great. You see your name <laughs> on the list and you're pardoned. One would have thought you were still in prison. What is the significance of having a pardon for something that you were, you've already been out of prison since 2006? Well, I served nine years in the Coast Guard, mm-hmm. and I was a Border Patrol agent for six, almost six, including the investigation time and everything. But after that, I really didn't know what to do because I had worked for the government for so mm-hmm. long. And um, I ended up going to prison. When I got out, I didn't know what to do. I eventually ended up in the oil field, and I, was pre- I, was, uh, I worked for a couple of big companies, Chesapeake Energy and mm. stuff, but I could not get past that truck driver level. I got, I got to, like, a, a, a trainer level. I couldn't get up into the management, and I got two degrees. Right. I managed to get my degree since I've been out of the prison. I got two degrees in associates and a bachelor's. I could not get into management because of the background. Right. No shit. Yeah, think, I was think, about, think, think about that from a crime bill perspective right who wrote that uh joe biden wrote ah, that gotcha, so gotcha, gotcha. We, we we talk about the crime bill a lot and the fact that uh, over three million black men have been put in prison because of it uh now how easy do you think it is for a black kid that got a felony for whatever reason at 17 to, to have a good career after that right probably impossible right yeah i mean look hearing your story it clearly is um, I mean, this is a guy that didn't have that same plight, served his country, and it still happened to him. So imagine mm-hmm. what it happens to people that are completely disenfranchised. Yeah. And we just we like to ignore that shit a lot because it's not me. But sometimes it is right. us. It can, it, it, what's that phrase, uh, there but for the grace of God go I, something like that? Exactly. Like, yeah. This shit can happen to any of us. That's why that, that statement, like, <clears throat> first they came for the socialists, and I didn't say shit because I wasn't a socialist. It is, it is imperative upon all of us to... to align ourselves against injustice every single day, regardless of who it's happening to or who the fucking person causing it is. You right. know what I mean? And this is one of those situations. We'll get into the details of your case, but it's fucking stupid. And, y- yeah, and, and were you lobbying for it? Um, I know like Ted Cruz and uh, John Cornyn and, and those guys were, but how does it start? Like, do you have to hire an attorney and say, all right, man, I want my life back. Here's how I go about this. Well, I've been I've been at it for a long time because after I got my pardon on the day before Christmas Eve and then January 14th, barely three weeks later, would have been 20 years that this initial incident that I went to prison for happened. So <clears throat> the guy I pushed on the ground happened 20 years ago. Um, so I've been actually trying to get this going for a long time, but I hadn't applied for a pardon because one of the things when you apply for a pardon, you have to show remorse and i did my job and yeah. i never denied what i did i mean if you've got a detainee and he tries to get up and you're telling him not to uh pushing him back down on the ground isn't i did exa- that's not brutality that's what you're trained to do literally exactly like in from the coat like the code people talk a lot of shit about the coast guard but to be honest uh the people that do interdiction for coast guard that's a pretty basically what you're doing is you're a fucking sea cop motherfucker i mean you yeah. you've been trained to be a police officer for years i was doing that back in 92 right? yeah exactly so it's like the same ttps in all those scenarios mm-hmm. you know what i mean it doesn't make any sense and and for the audience mm-hmm. out there um 
I guess share your story of what mm-hmm. happened because it, it started in like a, you were border patrol, right? Um, it, it, you were going after somebody in a in a pecan orchard in a pecan orchard, yeah. So it's the there is so the story is actually very simple. There's kind of like three parts of the story, but after the fact, like now twenty years later, I I realized so many things that happened that it's unreal that it even happened. And one thing I got to say is, look at what they did to General Flynn. And uh, even what they did to President Trump, Bernard Carrick, what mm. chance did I have against <clears throat> the federal government if they did that to all these high powered high high power people? Yeah, right? it, so all it, these, it, it I, had I to didn't seem stand hopeless. a chance. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So and nobody knows what it's like, what it feels like when the power of the federal government comes down on top of you. Well, it's, I mean Fred Durst might. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Obviously. Obviously. Um R. I. P. Nobody Is he still alive? no one knows what it's like to yeah, yeah. that's not really his song, I guess. That's no. that's yeah. Cover. That's a cover joke. It's more of a cover, but yeah. you know, Limp Biscuit still did it. So, uh, I mean, you guys were. It was a routine day for you guys, mm-hmm. right? Um, and uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Share your story. All right. So stop me at any time, but there's mm-hmm. parts to it. So January fourteenth, two thousand one, I was assigned downtown Eagle Pass, Texas, uh, around seven, around six thirty seven p.m. The scope truck, which is a infrared scope, it picks up about twenty feet in the air and it spots everything up to five miles away, spotted the group coming across. So me and my partner headed that way to go catch a group. It was a group of about 15 illegal aliens. And um, he started giving chase, and they were running towards us. So I was a passenger, so I got out on the foot, started chasing the group for about a mile and a half, the whole time yelling in Spanish, parense, parense, which means stop. Mm. They, were, they, were, they were running over barbed wire fences, through concrete laterals, and in, in a pecan, pecan orchard. Uh, another agent and his trainee rode up on me and I was losing the group because I had 38 pounds of gear already a mile and a half about a 15 minute foot chase they're like which way they go I was out of breath so I pointed they took off in the vehicle they got to a point where they couldn't drive anymore trainee fresh legs four days out in the field jumped out ran caught the group he was trying to get them to sit down Mm -hmm. there were some standing to his left some were sitting to his right he was going like this and just to be clear again in in policing whenever you're outnumbered like that you try to get everybody on the ground legs crossed so they can't jump up really fast there's a whole fucking process and there's a reason for it right Right. it's so you don't get overpowered by a larger force right it's it's not intimidation it's not brutality it's because i don't want to get into a fist fight with 12 dudes yeah exactly you know what i mean anyways continue there were two behind him that were squatting and they had their bags and they were, they were squatting, and they were doing this number. And I was still running up to them, and I can see them. I was kind of flanking them. And uh, I didn't know if they were going to jump the agent or get up and run because they were already apprehended. Mm, sure. <clears throat> so I ran up, and I did as I was trained. I put my hand on my weapon, and I used the bottom of my foot, and I pushed them both on the sides from the squatting to the sitting position. I knocked them on their ass. Never denied that. Yeah. Um, anybody that's been trained in the use of force says you always use, knows that you always use the minimum amount of force necessary to compel compliance. Right. Yep. But when you apply the force, you always apply 100% because you're not there to do math. You don't know, well, you know, Dan's about 6 feet, 210 pounds. I'm this. You, I'm going to only going to Mass use. times acceleration is uh, force, so how much do I have to do? No, you don't have that time. When yeah. you apply force, you yeah. apply 100% until he complies and you yeah. stop. Yeah. So I knocked him on the ass. Never denied that. That was it. Transported them to the station. Now, were they were they drugs? <laughs> no, nope. elite, just re- just just regular. Right. regular. Okay. The one particular guy that I got charged with was his fifth time in five days trying to get into the country. Oh, Kept yeah. getting sent back I mean, to Mexico. And, right. So, fast forward. That that was it. That's all that happened that night. They got I mean, trans- even even as a private citizen, technically, you would be able to do exactly what you did because <laughs> they're committing a crime in your presence. Uh, the crime of unlawful presence, right? Exactly. They're committing if that they crime. On your your property. property. Even if it's just a misdemeanor, if you're in pretty much every state in the country, uh, when it comes to citizen's arrest, even if you weren't a federal agent at the time, you can you can you can detain that person for doing mm-hmm. that. Like yeah. literally that is within the purview of any citizen in the country. Like if I saw you assaulting somebody and it was still simple assault mm-hmm. uh, or battery, which is a felony, I, I could I could interdict and stop that, sometimes even using deadly force, right? The this this I've read your scenario a bunch of times, and even if the worst thing that's been said is true, if you had to go up somebody's head to get compliance at that point, it still doesn't rise to the level of the shit you had to deal with. That's that's right. the like I honestly as somebody who's dealt with quite a few detainees, not here, but in other countries, like look, man, when you're when you're severely outnumbered in a very dangerous situation like that, 
there, it's not, you can't, you're not having a fucking tea party here. Right. Right. If you, if you need to fucking crack somebody and intimidate them enough, so they'll fucking, it, it's, it's, you set the tone. You know what I mean? I'm not saying that police should be walking around fucking, you know, talking down to people and, and slapping people around or something like that. But once you, that they, those people were 100% committing a crime. And pat- patrolling and the border is a completely different form of law it enforcement. Sure is, yeah. You know, because yeah. with all due respect to all my deputies, troopers, and police officers out there, but if they roll up on the scene and there's five dudes there and they got to go in, they're calling for backup. Yeah, for sure. We're, yeah. we're out there with 20, 30, 40, 50 people, and it's just you and your partner. There's no backup coming. There isn't, not, yeah, not for an hour. Um, yeah. Even, even when they had, uh, what was it, Operation Jumpstart in uh, 05 to 07 right. or something like that, they were backfilling uh, Border Patrol with, uh, with National Guard from mm-hmm. Texas, Nevada, and shit like that. Even then, they still didn't have the people. They, even, even today, they don't have the people to patrol that border. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Anyways, yeah, so, so, uh, so you, you walk up, put your foot. I mean, usually what I have been trained to do is to put my foot somewhere from the rib cage down to the hips that's where in that I put area, it. and just push them right back down into the ground. Right? That's what I put. That's it. the least you can apply a, a considerable amount of force without actually injuring somebody. Right? You can kick the shit out of this area of their body, and no physical harm will come to them. Maybe a bruise, but nothing really bad is going. It's not like you're hitting them in the head with a fucking aspartame or something. Exactly. Right. And, and so when this happens, uh, did this particular fellow? Did he say? Oh, I was I was treated unfairly, and I want to sue him. Or um, and again, this is completely a, a civilian question because I have no right. fucking idea what happens in this situation. It's shocking to hear that that was it. And then who reports that and says you did this, and I I want you to fucking go to jail. Well, when they brought him to the station, the station has a sign that says if you feel you've been treated unfairly, call this number and you can speak to the Mexican consulate. Normally, there's a procedure where they, t- they tell your supervisor, hey, this agent did this to me. The supervisor will call the Mexican consulate. They'll come have a conversation. If they feel something was done wrong, they'll either give you a reprimand or, invest- or do an <laughs> in- internal investigation. Yeah. Or if they feel it was criminal, they'll go outside and you know, continue it from there. Well, this particular alien saw the Mexican consulate on his way out, talked to him. The consulate left and went to the U.S. attorney. U.S. Attorney went to the office of the Inspector General, and the Inspector General came down on my ass. My, when they took my weapon away and, and put me on, a, on desk duty for 18 months, my bosses were like, we don't know what this is. It's not us. Mm. This is outside. Mm. So, well, I don't know why we would, uh, f- I mean, one, the Mexican uh, government just arrested like 30 of their police officers at the border for doing fucked up shit. Mm-hmm. Like people they always are, have. They've just been disappearing people for the last couple of months. They're like, hey, we got, we got to do something. Just mm-hmm. arrest those guys over there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Fuck these people. And I don't know. I've never understood. Like, I worked for USCIS doing intelligence for a while, right? I don't understand why we give civil rights to people that are illegally in our country. According to the U.S. attorney at my trial, he had some civil rights because he was 400 feet into the United States, so he had 400 feet of civil rights because the Constitution says any person in the United States, not any citizen. Yeah, well, we should probably look into changing that. <laughs> and, and, but to a point, I agree, because just because you're an illegal alien or doesn't mean you have the right to be you know, beaten up. No, for I didn't sure. do any of that. that sure, that's my yeah. point. You know? no, so, but there's a limit, too. I mean, uh, yeah, you have civil rights, but you don't have the right to commit a crime with impunity. Agreed. Right. And you don't have the right to resist arrest. So what the fuck are we talking about? here? Right. And and according to these court records, uh, (laughs) what they're saying is um, that you assaulted a man that was uh, seated next to him and asked him whether he liked to run and then pushing him to the ground with his foot and then striking him with his hand. So this illegal alien, there's a a a part to that, a guy that a guy that 100 percent does not speak English somehow interpreted this fucking uh, Cajun fucking uh, hillbilly over here. There's no way. He, back then, he understood what you were saying, right? He understood Even, what I was saying perfectly. Yo hablo español perfectamente. Oh, you were talking shit to him in Spanish? I, I talked to him in well, Spanish. There you go. He understood yeah. exactly what yeah. I was saying. But that comment came out at the trial, Russ. At my trial, the U.S. attorney says... So wait, you're saying it wasn't in the pre-file court documents? No, sir. That, that, that whole thing that he just said? Yeah. So he's the, introducing new evidence at the trial then? Well, he's, he's rearranging my words. Yeah, I see. Because he, at the trial, he said, so you mm-hmm. ran up and you wound your leg up to Cincinnati and you were yelling, so you like to run, huh? And then proceeded to kick the bejesus out of this illegal alien. Those were his words. Yeah. <laughs> I said, and I told him, I said, I don't know what comic book you've been reading. And this is me on the stand. I don't know what comic book you've been reading, sir. I said, but that didn't happen that way. I ran mm-hmm. up. 
I put my hand <laughs> on my weapon and I pushed him with the bottom of my I didn't wind my leg up. I pushed him. Big difference. It would yeah. work. And then I asked him, why are you running? Yeah. I didn't say, so you like to run, huh? Yeah, I asked yeah. him, why are you running? That but, changes everything. By the way, yeah. it, wouldn't, it wouldn't work effectively if you wound up and kicked him like that. Like, do, no. they, do you understand physics and shit? You he, would get up, he would get up and fight me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because I, you know, I'm reading your statement. It says, I ran up to the aliens, uh, and with the bottom of my foot, I pushed the first alien to the ground, and I told him to sit down, as I said. Uh, Siantense? Uh, Siantense. Is, yeah, yeah, sit down. Yeah, I, I'm close. Um, and then um, I turned, it, it says you, and this was uh, in a blog written by you. I then turned to the second alien, pushed him to the ground, I too. Did. So y- you weren't denying any of this whatsoever. No, sir. But you certainly just didn't kick the shit out of these I guys, did not. right? Um, in a case like this, when you are on trial and it's your word against theirs, why are they not trusting the officer versus a guy who has illegally tried to get into the country five five days in a row? I don't know. But what I, like I said... I mean, a guy that had up until that point, uh, what, thir- 14 years of service about- in the federal government, in the military, and then, yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, like... If you had had a history of abuse before, that might become Which, something. But now that you said that, that yeah. brings me to the second part. Okay. There's a whole second part okay. to this. Sure. Speaking <clears throat> of the history, that happened January 14th, 2001. Mm-hmm. On February 22nd, where I showed you that picture. Yeah, actually, we have this picture. Can you insert it right here onto the screen? Um, great. Um, can, can Describe to the audience. It, by the way, if you're not subscribed, uh, subscribe to... Drinking Bros podcast on YouTube. Man, you those see old this uniforms photo. are ugly as shit. Dude. I know they're crazy. <laughs> this looks like a, an old Robert Rodriguez movie. Yeah. Um, show, <laughs> show the first picture there. Now, describe what this is. It says uh, February twenty second, two thousand one. So that was six weeks later after I pushed this first illegal alien on the ground. It was about four thirty in the morning, and it was a quiet night. And I was working with my partner, and some other agents had some forty six traffic, which mm-hmm. is narcotics coming across the river. Uh-huh. Um, we responded for backup because normally when there's 46 traffic, there's guns. Sure. So, and it, it's one of the most dangerous situations mm-hmm. an agent can be in. So we, we, the, the group got jumped. There were seven mules. They, they dropped the dope. We had caught five. We scattered around. They caught five. Two were missing and they couldn't find them. And the guy at the station, the infrared uh, camera operator had mm-hmm. spotted them with the camera sitting in some high grass a couple of fields away. So they kind of guided me in. And uh, I hopped the fence, and I was walking towards him. I could hear my earpiece saying, all right, to your 10 o'clock. And then I saw their silhouettes, and I started walking towards them. And once they saw me, they got up started running. Mm. So I started chasing them. They got to a, uh, they got to a fence line, and I, I'm probably 10, 15 feet behind them. They banged the right because they knew I was going to catch them if they decided to go through the fence. They were running down the fence line, came to another fence line. And the first guy came and jumped through the fence in between the strands like Superman. It's pretty impressive. Holy like, shit. Yeah, they do that. It's, That's I mean, awesome. I mean, I mean he barb- made it through? Oh, yeah. They do it all the time. Barbs everything. It scrapes Look, them up. Legality and all aside, he earned it. He did. Yeah. <laughs> he fucking earned and it. Like yeah. I said, it's pretty impressive to yeah. watch, man. Yeah. Superman in between it. barbed wire. Yeah. So the second guy, I was, I was probably about six feet behind him. He hit the fence and flopped over. And I had body armor on. So I was like, you know what? I'm getting, I'm getting these guys. So yeah. I hit the fence and flopped over as well. So you Superman it too? No, no, no I, no, I flopped yeah. over the fence. Okay, cool. Because yeah. I was like, like yo, second, oh, no. if you were like, hey man, I'm, I'm gonna, you think you're gonna fucking top me, dude? It's like uh, a slam dunk contest. No, I'll go sir. right through that shit. Uh, uh-uh, uh, uh-uh, no. uh. Uh-uh. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen, I've seen them do it, and I've seen what happens afterwards. I don't like it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they can get away. Yeah. But uh, so now all three of us are on the on the ground in this high grass on the other side. The first guy, Superman, got up and ran. He got away. And the second guy was getting up, and I, was, I got him by the legs, and I brought him back down, and we were tussling and wrestling. I was trying to get to my feet, and uh, I don't know exactly how it happened, but I saw my boots and the stars in the same picture, and this fucking body slammed me on the ground, jumped on top of me, and grabbed me by the neck. So I pushed him off, but we were sweating, and my hand slipped off of him. So I'm on the ground, and he pinned this hand to the ground, and he had his right hand on my throat, and I had his shirt like this. And I'm like, mm. yeah. oh, shit, I'm in trouble. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. And all I, I kept looking around, all I could see was high grass. I can still smell his body odor because his sweat was dripping on my face. Uh, a bunch of things went through my mind. Uh, he had a polo shirt, and I kept thinking, if I can get to my gun, that's where I'm going to put the bullet. And I even mm. thought, I'm going to have to turn my head. 
I might lose an eardrum. Yeah. And then I started seeing <clears throat> spots and I'm, and I said, you know what? I'm going to die. I said, God, please help me. And I don't know how I did it next, but I broke my right hand free. I struck him on the side. I struck him in the temple and he fell off to the side. I rolled over on top of him and I put my forearm into his throat. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> at that time, I can now he's on the bottom. Right. I can feel him grabbing at my handcuffs. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, my, my gun belt. <clears throat> and I got pepper spray, baton, oh, yeah. weapon. So I said, all right, this is going to end here. So I wound my fist up here and I punched him three times in the nose. Mm -hmm. Felt his nose break on the second one. Yeah. And then on, after the third punch, he said, Officer, please stop hitting me. Yeah. In Spanish, Ofe Oficial, ya no me pegues. Mm. I said, well, stop fighting, fucker. No, <laughs> no pelees, puto. <laughs> you know? And, uh, and I can hear on my earpiece a camera operator yelling for everybody to get to me. And I can see agents around me, but we were in the high grass. So right. I couldn't, you know. But once he, gave, once he actually gave up, I raised my hand and I guided the agents in. They dragged them and cuffed them up. And I actually lied on the ground for a good two, three minutes catching my breath. So he got sentenced to 57 months in prison. Okay. For assaulting a federal officer. No, right. they didn't charge him with that. Jesus Christ. No. Because, for unlawful presence or what? No, for, for, for drugs. Oh, for drugs. For drugs. Okay. Um, but the thing is, Dan, <laughs> we, we in the Border Patrol get into so many altercations on a daily basis. As, and, and they don't even report this. That right. If we had to file assault on a federal agent with every time somebody oh, yeah, assaulted a federal no agent, there's no way. There's no way. I we mean, had when, to have resident FBI agent. When, when I was there in uh, 2016, and, and that's, that's when I did most of my time, I think there were out of the 500 some uh, federal immigration judge slots, 275 were empty at the time. That's, that, that's really, of all the things uh, of you guys out in the audience that you didn't like a, about the Obama administration, the fucking, the constant progress towards war, the drone strike stuff, the shitty Affordable Care Act and all that, the worst thing that happened during that administration is they punted entirely mm -hmm. on the entire immigration issue. They didn't do shit in eight years to do anything about that. They didn't, they didn't get judges in office. They didn't do anything about reform on policy stuff. They built all these cages that everybody was That's so right. super upset about. Kids being in, which by right. the way, they're back in now. Yes. Yeah. Now that now they've they've retailored that language to say, oh, uh, for 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 humanity's sake, for COVID, we've put the kids and women separately now. Like, oh, you mean back in the fucking cages that you were just bitching about what a month the, what and they a half were ago? blaming our you president stupid for? Stupid fuck! Yeah. I mean, Jesus Christ, dude. Uh, well, and what was the next picture here that you brought? Um, well, this is the dope he seized from those guys. Okay, so this is this is the amount of, of right. dope that you yeah. seized from these guys. What did you say, 800 pounds of weed? 800 pounds. God, yes. you could have just brought that to my house. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Dan would have smoked it all that. It smelled good, too. I got to admit that. <laughs> I, bet. I bet it did. But That reminds me of that scene from Super Troopers where they're like, they do that big weed bust. He goes, hey, that uh, that weed you, you guys got, was there a weird sticker on it? And the guy like looks in his pocket like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so... The, the the craziest thing is with the pictures that you've shown us and what you actually got arrest I mean arrested for like the fuck what the fuck I mean if you had, if there's you had, more if you had what put the guys fuck is wrong with our country if you and, put and some, the laws in it if you put some guys on their knees out in there and just fucking executed them and left them there in the in the in the dirt that's probably not great it's not great right, right? right? you would have been justified no like, even like but but that's an extreme situation what your experience is not extreme no you, you and you got to remember this. I went to the Border Patrol from doing law enforcement in the Coast Guard, mm -hmm. but I was a search and rescue agency. Right. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm into saving lives. Yeah, yeah. Yep. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm into saving lives. Yep. Um, but then they took my weapon away, and I was behind a desk for 18 months. Modified. Nobody told me anything then. So you're on modified assignment for 18 months, 18 and nobody months. gave you any information. At the fort. Like, is there, are there not... I don't know this. I know that the fed I know federal employees have a union, but is there a is there a union specifically for 1811s and and the uh, what's the other one 1801s and shit like that? Right. We w the Border Patrol has the National Border Patrol Council. But, but is, back then, it was but is it like weak. a PBA rep though? Yeah. Like in the police, so that you have. But that. back then, now it's a lot better since right. my case and a bunch of other cases that have happened. But back mm -hmm. then, it was pretty weak. And my union basically told me that they said, "Good luck. <laughs> if you if you win your trial, we'll refund you seventy five percent of your attorney's fees." <laughs> oh, I'm nice. like, I need an attorney. Yeah. Bitches, yeah, like, <laughs> you yeah, know. Fuck, man. But um, so at the 14 month mark, I got a letter saying that I was a target investigation. I gave the gave the guy's name and the and the date. Mm. And here's the irony of this part of the irony of this whole story. The guy I pushed on the ground, his first name, his first middle name were Miguel Angel, mm -hmm. Miguel Angel, Miguel yep. Angel. So was the drug smuggler, but they had different last names. So. 
I thought I was being prosecuted for the whole drug smuggler thing because I broke the guy's nose. Oh, God. So for so for 14 <laughs> months, I'm sitting here going, what did I do? I said I went through every level of use of force. I used to teach the use of force in the Coast Guard, so I know it very well. Yeah, yeah. Right, so I'm like, what did I do? I said, I said, officer present, verbal commands, soft empty hand, hard empty hand. I said, the guy's still alive, and he was killing. He was, he was about to kill to, me. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> what did I do wrong? Then, and 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 in strange government matter, when I got the guy's name, I was like, who is this guy? When I went to the in the computer, there was about a six week block of things that were gone from the computer. So I went to the hard files, the paper paperwork. That specific case was gone, disappeared. Isn't that, um, I mean, they, they, you, you have the constitutional right to due process regardless if you're a federal agent or not, which means discovery comes into that. Before the trial, you have to be giving any evidence, right? And, they, and, and, the, and the process of trying to hide evidence even before discovery is due is a crime, right? It so came, it you came filed, out the, I'm asking if you filed any lawsuits about that 14 month gap, because I think you might have a case there, frankly. No, no. Like I said, back then I was, I was real naive to it. And well, now there's no statute of limitations on government It's 20 years ago, man. It doesn't matter. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah there's yeah. no statute of limitations yeah. on being able to sue the federal government. Yeah. If you wanted that. to, but I, 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 mean, right, I, I, I absolutely, I would at least look into it because honestly, uh, it's going to my book. It's, it's less yeah. about, it's less about the money and more about the precedent. Right. No, not, no, no. not allowing it to happen to the next guy. That's the I real understand, important but part. financially for him to pay uh, attorneys that, unless you find somebody pro bono. Uh, Natalie Kwan would probably do that for you. She works with uh, veterans quite a bit. Uh, really? spe- speaking of which, yeah. uh, Richard Stasekow is actually coming back on yeah. the show here pretty yeah. soon to give us an update on that. So, yeah, I, yeah. we'd be happy to give you Natalie's yeah. number. But, I'd uh, love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She could look, look into it. I think you might have a case there because, d- hi, like, isolating you and keeping you away from the facts. It, it takes away your fucking uh, right to self-defense, right? You can't, they, they cannot do that. Absolutely. When I went to trial then in 18, well, I went to trial at the 18 month mark, mm. all right? Cause I, I got put on investigation in March of 2001. My trial started in October of 2002. Right. Not once did I speak to an investigator. Not once did anybody ask me my version of the story about, Hey, what happened that night until I was on the <laughs> stand in a courtroom and my attorney asked me. Why didn't your attorney uh, was he was he appointed by the government or no? I I couldn't find an attorney that I can afford. So who, who yeah who gave? Who so was, I I actually found one in Houston. Gotcha. Don't know if he was the best one because we actually lost and he's dead now. But <laughs> doesn't sound like it. Well, you didn't know um, you were the target of an investigation until uh, um, like 14, 14 out months. of the eighteen months in. Well, right? I knew I was getting investigated. I didn't know why. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you didn't. Like, he had no way to prepare himself. Right. And I, I didn't, couldn't find an attorney until I knew why. Well, even if you had found an attorney, what the fuck would he have done? Exactly. Uh, stupid Without question. Information. But why didn't Border Patrol provide one for That's you? That's what I was asking. They, about the yeah. PBA thing. Like, if there's no... Their no. union so- Even the Federal Employees Union, the FEU now sucks. So I can't imagine how bad it was back then. Right now, the Border Patrol has a much better union there and with a bunch of other, uh, like, like FLEO, the Federal Law yeah, Enforcement yeah. Association, and CLEAT, and... But back then, 20 years ago, they weren't. So it was basically on them. And basically back then, what the union, Border Patrol Union did was collect money and good luck. Jesus so, Christ. Yeah. Uh, it sounds so unbelievable. Forgive me for Tell me about sounding it. shocked over and over and over again. But it, it, it's one of those things that you hear about and you're like, oh, this seems like a fucking Dateline case on like a Friday night. Yeah. That you would watch and be like, man, that guy got <laughs> fucked for 20 years. Brother, that's why I have the support that I have from so many law enforcement officers yeah. across the country. Yeah. You know, because... What I did, I never denied, and I did what I was taught. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, on social media and, and, you know, throughout the past 20 years and stuff, I get a lot of hate and stuff, but they read the, the DOJ press release. Sure. You know, because that's what they put out. Because anybody that's never been charged by the federal government doesn't know that if the federal government decides, hey, Ross, you know what? You kicked the shit out of these two guys, and we're charging you with it. And even though you didn't and say you didn't, they're going to be like, oh, yeah, we're going to prove that you did. And by the time it's done, you did it. <laughs> yeah, you, you know? can't yeah. you can't sue the uh, Department of Justice for defamation. No for example. No. And no. As a matter of fact, you have to get permission from Congress to sue the federal government I mean, at all. Yeah. I mean, brother, right now, a perfect example is look at President Trump. Yeah. They're telling him you did this. Yeah. Well, that's been going on for four years. Right. I mean, apparently it was it was OK. Twenty. It was, it was for him. Yeah. It was OK to undermine the sanctity of our electoral process to accuse Trump of colluding with Russia for four years, but not OK for them to ask about any kind of strange shit that may have happened Correct. this year. 
Those, yeah, are, those are the yeah. two very different <clears throat> things. Apparently. And, then, and then they wanted him to testify for the impeachment thing. Like, <laughs> oh, he should totally show off. up. I, he said God no. Damn, I was surprised he said I, no. But that's it probably been awesome. the smartest thing he's ever done because one of the worst things that I did during my trial was testify. Yeah. yeah. So, so we'll, we'll get to that now. Uh, even going up to, to testify, right? In court that day, you're walking up to the stand. You still know in your heart that you did nothing wrong whatsoever. Correct. So you're probably walking up to say, all right. Great. You want my side of the story? Here's my um, side of the story. No, it's pretty I would, easy. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to get in your way of answering that. But if, from my perspective, having worked there and been in the military and dealt with shitty command, you were probably fucking super anxious walking in the room. You probably felt like you were getting fucked before you even got there. Right? I mean, that's how I would have felt. I, honestly. I I did, but like I said, I was I was thirty something years old back then, yeah. and I was a lot more. <laughs> I'm fifty four years old now, so I was in my thirty four years old, yeah. and uh, thirty three maybe. But I still believed in the halls of justice. I believed in my system. Yeah. I, be- I had been working for the government yeah. for so long. I believed in what I was doing. I think it's an important, uh, it's really important for people to see the non-stereotypical person get fucked over by the government. So it's not a, a 17-year-old black kid from the streets or anything. Like, it's a dude who served his country and then did what he was trained to do and still got fucked over. Yeah. If that's not enough. If all these people that have doubts. If that's not enough evidence that there's a problem with our criminal justice system and the way we treat not only people in general, but particularly people who serve our communities, right, then you're never going to learn that lesson if you don't learn it here. Yeah, so I, you go up on the stand, you testify, and what do they say to combat your story? All right, so this this is... A I mean, what circus. evidence did they have other than I, the fact that these two illegal aliens who are committing a, actively one, committing a they crime? They only brought one. Yeah, yeah. They only brought one. But this is a three-ring circus, so check Oof. this out. Trial started on a Monday, uh-huh. all right? 2002, yep. October. Started on a Monday. Monday morning, jury selection to about noon, all right? About 11, 11 11.30, then we uh, adjourned for lunch, mm-hmm. came back around 1 p.m. 1 p.m., the trial started. The government brought in the illegal alien. Then they brought in the two agents, the trainee agent and mm-hmm. his journeyman, his FTO, uh, who, who was a friend of mine, mm-hmm. <clears throat> to testify. The agent was the first... I, I take that back. The agent, uh, the trainee agent was the first one to testify. Okay. He testified that he couldn't believe what he was seeing because he had everything under control, and I ran up, and I kicked this guy on the ground, and uh, I said, so, uh, so you want to run, huh? And I proceeded to punch him in the, in the torso so hard that he can hear the guy's breaths coming out going, uh, uh, uh. Then I grabbed a second guy, threw him on top of the first guy, punched him, and possibly some punches to a third guy. Now, why did he say this? I don't know. And the only thing I can come up with is I've been, I was an agent for a while, worked for the government for a while. The U.S. attorney will try to turn you into their side. So he was a freshly new little boot. So they probably got him and said, hey, this is Plato. We can mold him however we want. What's his name? Uh, Marcelino Alegria. Is he still alive today? Uh, he is. He's, he's a supervisor down in Zapata, Texas. Really? Yeah. I'm sure his career is doing fine. So check yeah. this out. Here, here, here comes the kicker. All right. Um, the illegal alien was the second witness. Mm-hmm. He says, I ran up and I pushed him on the ground, but I never punched him. He testified I never punched him. Says he never laid a hand on me, but I put my knee in his neck and put his neck in the, his face in the ground, which I also didn't do, but he says <clears> I didn't punch him. So not, not a single hit. He couldn't corroborate no. what the other agent no, had just testified right. before him. Um, so what does your lawyer do afterwards? Well, we tried objecting, but the judge wasn't having it. The judge that we had, uh, y'all ain't from Texas, so y'all wouldn't know. His name is William Wayne Justice. He was appointed by LBJ at the time, was the senior most federal judge in Texas, uh-huh. and he's a very liberal judge. Is he alive today? No, he died. Yeah. Um, so the, my lawyer has me stand up in the courtroom and he asked the illegal alien, is this the guy that kicked you? And the guy looks at me, he's like, I don't know. I never saw his face. But I never denied what I did. You know, I could have just said, it wasn't me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I could have just yeah. said, it wasn't me. He can't identify me. It, it was one of them two. Yeah. But, you know, integrity, right? Right, yeah. Doing the right thing even though nobody's looking. Right, sure. I, I never denied what I did because what I did was what I was taught. 
So well, it's more important than the adjudication of your individual case. Like that has to be part of the use of force, and that has to be okay for people to do because it's uh, it's not it's a matter of officer safety at that point. Right. You have to be able to use some amount of force. Otherwise, what the fuck are we doing here? You know what I mean? Well, Border Patrol agents get rocked all the time. Oh, they yeah. throw rocks at oh, us. Yeah, yeah. Janet, Janet <clears throat> Reno, when she was the attorney general, said that we had to run away. It was our job to run away if somebody's throwing rocks at us. And, and I said this on several radio shows, and I don't recommend anybody doing it, okay? Right. But next time you get pulled over, imagine this. You get pulled over by a sheriff's deputy, police officer, state trooper, pick up a brick. Yeah, and just okay, yeah. And see, <laughs> what see if they run away. Yeah, right. See what happens. Um, but, yeah. Ross, yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you, but, but when you're there, right, you give your side of the story to your lawyer. In cross examination, what did they say back in in return to this? Of like, all right, well, the guy didn't see you. The first guy is the agent is testifying to something completely different than their clients, so right. to speak. What's the cross examination like from them to prove that you actually did this? The assistant U.S. attorney, Bill Bauman, comes up and he, he has me read part of the use of force that he's got underlined. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I start reading the whole thing. And he goes, no, just read the part that's underlined. I said, you can't. It's a continuum, bitch. Right. You can't. It says use of force continuum. Right. Yeah. And I told him, you can't pick and choose from your little static environment where you're at what I'm going to do in the field. This is just a guideline. He, go, he snatches it out of my hand from, from the bench. Yeah. I was sitting on the bench. He goes, this is the second time I've heard this use of force policy referred to as as a as a uh as a uh guideline yeah. is that what you think of the constitution so i grab i said can i see that and the judge made him give it back to me and i went to the back and it says summary and it said because i taught this before yeah, i yeah. know what it says yeah, yeah. it says this use of force policy is, be, is for agents to use as a guideline it, said, it literally it says said it specifically. In the use and the reason policy. it says that is because let's just say you're working on a five base use of force so one is no force five is deadly force right, right. Uh, you don't have to go through every single one of those. If I if I'm like talking to you first, and then I go uh, open hands with you first, right, and then all of a sudden you pull a weapon, I'm going to five. You're gonna die, mm -hmm. right? Right. Yeah, I have to go through th uh, three, four before I go to five. You don't have to. This is like that's that's the reason. You have to have uh, some kind of fucking trust and the tr and the training and the integrity of the officer in the first place to reasonably manage this shit, right? We don't see. Here's what we don't see. Despite all the rhetoric around Border Patrol and how racist America is and blah, 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 and all this shit about, about uh, uh, Mexicans and Guatemalans coming to this country, you don't see fucking people getting beheaded or shot to no, death sir. on the border because it would be fucking news, believe me. If AOC can make news out of an empty parking lot down there, I'm pretty sure one dead body would be on the fucking front page of every goddamn liberal newspaper in this country. You never see it. You literally never see that shit, ever. So what was his response to that once you, you showed him the guidelines and everything else? He's, he snatched it out of my hands and he says, and, and he says, well, why did you have to kick him to the ground? And he goes, why can you just, and he, why, why can't you just ask him to sit down nicely? Ask him to sit ask down him, nicely. And he, and, and, and he kind of put his hands like that, made that. And I you said, should have challenged him to a wrestling match right there in the, in the courtroom. <laughs> like, seriously, I mean, it sounds absurd, but like, I'm going to try to fucking get away. You wrestle me to the ground. Stand and we'll by. See how it works out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I asked the judge and I knelt down mm -hmm. and I said, come put your hands on me, sir. And he said, why? And I, and I said, just do it. I'm not going to do that. Why not? Because I don't know what you're going to do. And I said, exactly. And you're here in front of a judge, jury, and a district court officer, but what you want me to do it out in the field? Yeah. And veins popped out of his head. And, <laughs> you know, and, and, but hold on. So, real quick, uh, not, not, too, not too deep, but the third agent, yeah. the FTO, yeah. testified that he was 80 yards away. He didn't see me punch anybody, but he can hear the kick from 80 yards away, three quarters of wow. a football field. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. But the illegal alien couldn't remember what side I kicked him on. <laughs> So, but he, here's the other part. So I thought that was it. Well, wait, don't, I, I don't know if it was the case back then, but uh, there's full on uh, photographs taken anytime you take anybody into custody on the border, right? Or any of those uh, waypoints inside the border. It's not just the actual border that's guarded. There's like 400 miles and then it depends on, like there's, there's uh, border patrol checkpoints in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because those are major throughways and shit like that. Anyways, uh was you, there photographs of yeah, his body? Yeah, you take photographs of the body. If you kick somebody hard enough for somebody to hear it 80 yards away in a field with tall grass and shit like that out there in the middle of nowhere, holy shit, dude. I mean, yeah, yeah, they, was, was there photographs that's of, pretty of impressive. The, the victim? Yeah. <clears throat> they wouldn't allow him. The judge wouldn't allow him. Why? Because it was incriminating evidence towards the illegal alien. 
Wouldn't admit oh, him. He boy. just That's actually him. I know that sucks, but that is actually something that happens in the court of law. If that guy has to defend himself that, later in court, then you can't introduce evidence that would violate his Fifth Amendment rights. Now, example, but hold like on. That. So but the Mexican consulate had pictures of him and they allowed those, but they wouldn't allow mine. Like that picture that I showed you after the fight with the dope smuggler. Uh-huh. This dope smuggler comes into the court case here in a minute. They wouldn't allow that picture. Really? They would not allow that picture. The judge would not allow it. Okay. So, so by the uh, trial started Monday afternoon. Mm-hmm. By 1030 in the morning on Tuesday morning, the government was done with what I had been charged Wait, with. Wait, I'm sorry. Say that again. Say the date and time. On mo- the, the jury selection started Monday morning. Yep. Trial started <laughs> Monday afternoon. Tuesday morning at 1030, the, ju- the, the prosecution was done with what I was being charged with. But they want to allow some more evidence. So the, the lawyers went up to the bench. They spoke a little bit for about 10 minutes, came back. I said, what's going on? Mm. My, my lawyer's telling me, he goes, they're going to bring in a dope smuggler. I'm like, what? And, and I'm like, what are you talking about? He's got nothing to do with this. It happened six weeks later. Mm. And all of a sudden, <clears throat> and now, now let me set it, set it up for you. I'm here next to my attorney. Right. The, the judge and the bench are over here. Mm-hmm. The prosecution's over there. Uh, the benches, the, the pews, and the doors are over there. The doors open up, and in walks this guy. Now he's got long hair. He looks a little more meek. He was about maybe five four, mm-hmm. but man, he was a brick shit house. Yeah, yeah. Right. So he starts walking in, and he's got a U.S. marshal in tow because they ridded the drug smuggler out of prison to come testify against me. And the guy walked in, and he scanned the room, and when he saw me, his eyes focused on me. And as he was walking towards the bench the whole time, his eyes were on me. So I, 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 I saw him come in. And I was like, mm. I stood up. <clears throat> and the whole time till he got to the bench, he sat down. It wasn't until he was sat down with the marshal behind him that I sat in my chair. I crossed my arms. And for the next four hours, me and him, Ross, were like this. Why did you stand up? I don't know if you've had anybody ever try to kill you with their bare hands. But if they did... And they put that same dude in the room with you the next time around. I'm mm-hmm. not going to be sitting down when it yeah. happens. What, did, did part of you <laughs> think, all right, if I stand up? Here, I got scared. Gotcha. I got scared. This, this Last thing I remember of, of this guy, he was choking me out in the middle of a field in tall grass. Sure. You know, and now he's in the same room with me. Did any part of you think, all right, if I, but if I am standing up, it's going to be viewed as a threatening position. And this is part of. Didn't. This will be viewed as part of my behavior. I don't, you don't think about it. I understand, but yeah. I, but even even if you had thought about it, and I mean, or if you had had the the wherewithal to do that, you're, there's no way your brain reacts that quickly. Your, your brain. No, no, no. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying your, your brain does, but I'm saying I'm, I'm sure the judge like and the jury, fact, yeah, right, l- looked at it that way of like, oh, here's this guy being aggressive again. And That's because you shouldn't be judged on your actions as an officer like that by people that don't understand what the fuck's going on on the ground. Yeah, you know I, I mean? look, I, I, I said that at the trial. Yes, if I if yes. I if I in war do something that seems unseemly and I get tried, there's a reason for military tribunals, mm-hmm. right? There's a reason they don't send that to civilian court because it's not the same fucking thing. And the fact that we're going to bring in a civilian court to determine whether or not something was too aggressive when somebody's trying to interdict a crime and a violent crime at that, Mm -hmm. that's ridiculous, right? Right. That's like bringing in a fucking librarian to figure out what our uh, physicist guy was talking about a few minutes ago. Sure. I mean, it's it's a complete non sequitur. Why? Just because you know what general right and wrong is as a society, if you're a member, if you're a civilian in society, that, that doesn't give you any context into what it means to be in a fight for your life with no backup coming. Uh, yeah, I, People could not contextualize that I, I, I understand. So for four hours, you're locked in a, a, in a virtual steering match with this guy. What does he say as he's testifying? He, he's locked with me. Mm-hmm. His eyes are locked with me. He's got an interpreter because he doesn't speak English. Mm-hmm. And every time he's asked a question, he turns towards the jury, answers a question, turns back towards me. So he was definitely coached on that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So... So uh, basically, he tells the story uh, that I just told you about me chasing him down, except he didn't go through a barbed wire fence. He tripped. He tripped, and ah. I, I caught him because I wasn't going to be able to catch him otherwise. So he <laughs> tripped, and then I pinned him down, and I put my gloves on, mm-hmm. and I then proceeded to beat him. You carefully he, he took resist. your time, put your gloves on, and right. then proceeded to beat yeah, him. Yeah, and he put some wax in his mustache and twisted it up at the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Get yeah, the yeah. fuck out of here. Yeah, so. None of these people have ever been in a fist fight in their lives. Anybody 
I, I, I bet juries, despite the fucking racist history in the South in this country, I bet juries for stuff like this were probably a lot more reasonable back then. People that had been... It was an Austin jury. Like, people... I know, but that was, like, in 2000. I'm talking about, like, in the 80s, 70s, 60s. Right. Uh, when, I mean, worse shit was going on back then, but I bet there's, their frame of reference is that if I talk too much shit or if I do... If I, if I get up in somebody's face and threaten them, they're going to punch me in the fucking right. face. And that's expected and reasonable for that to happen by the way yeah like, we, we've gotten so soft about this stuff it's so bizarre let me tell you we I, have, did your lawyer <laughs> object to to this at all of like i, I mean it was overruled mm-hmm. okay um it's funny how we use how we have used historically if you if you think about any of the major cases of of law enforcement or federal agents that have been charged and convicted of things where they use criminals Right with an axe to grind as witnesses against them. That is fucking bananas to me. I'm telling you. You know what I mean? Like you immediately, as a as a reasonable human being, if somebody that he had just put in jail for what was it, fifty six months? You said fifty seven. Fifty seven yeah. months. Uh, somebody he just put in jail for several years. Right now is going to come testify against me. You don't you don't question the integrity of that man's fucking testimony. Hey, would you like to go home? Yeah, we need exactly. you to testify against this agent in another case. Yeah. Did he get to go home after? He did. That? He did. He, well, like, after that, there was no. To this day, there's no record of him in the in the uh, federal system in the, in the federal bureau of prison system. And after that, his records were sealed, and nobody can find him. Why? Why did the government spend so much time, money, and effort trying to convict you, who actually works for the the, the government itself, and then let the criminals go? Like I. I'm, I'm yeah, mystified. Well, here's, by a, here's another question for you, Ross, and if you can answer this one, uh, I will fucking quit, and this will be my last show. Sure. <laughs> Why are there 11 to 12 million illegal immigrants in this country right now? I think, me personally, I um, mean, there's no legit answer to the question. Well, I, you, neither side will do anything. I, I think Democrats and Republicans have both punted on this issue for years mm-hmm. and years and years. Do something one way or the other. Uh, there's an, there is a there is a very legitimate answer to this question, by the way, what should to what should be done on the border. And it's what I wrote my master's thesis on in Germany and Poland. Right. So mm-hmm. Germany had a huge problem with Polish immigrants coming across the border and working illegally. It was causing inflation. Right. It was causing uh, all these uh, jobs that used to pay. Let's say it's twenty five bucks an hour. U.S. standard. Right. All these jobs were paying like that. We're now paying seven dollars an hour to illegals because they don't pay taxes. All this revenue is missing. There's illegal shit going on. You can't track the people coming in and out. Blah blah blah. Everything that comes with the with the uh, uh, the smuggling portion that is attached to that. Right. Sure. So what did Germany do? Germany said we're going to issue work permits to Polish people. Pretty much anybody that wants one, as long as you can prove that you're not an asshole. We'll issue a work permit. You can come over here and work for however long you want. Go back, back and forth, blah, blah, blah. If you were a German company and you hire somebody that is, does not have that card, your business is shut down, all of your assets are liquidated, and you go to jail, right? That's step one, obviously. Step two is to start leveraging some of the goddamn technology we've got. What the fuck are we doing, man? He's talking about 20 fucking years ago. We have these right. thermal scanners with a five-mile range. What do you think we have now? Oh, yeah. You think you can fucking hide? We're going to build a goddamn border wall? I mean, look. A border wall could be, I guess, a layer in defense. I don't think it's necessary, but you could. We can literally cover all the fucking the entire border, the entire border with drones, and have helicopter fucking direct action teams like Nest teams, the way they're set up and stuff like that that interdict this stuff. So much, and then seismographic thermal scans of the ground to find these tunnels. There's so much thousands stuff. Of sensors. There's yeah. so much stuff that we can fucking do. But none of that works, Dan, unless there's a man. Unless, no, no. Unless you let the agents enforce the laws that they're right, supposed well, to enforce. Yeah. Let the agents do their damn job. I mean, it's an it's an interesting theory. Like, obviously, we don't want to fucking abuse people. No, we, of course we, not. We, in particular, we don't want to abuse people that have already been abused. And the reason they're coming here is because America's awesome. Like, they're not coming here because it Land sucks. Of milk and honey. It's not. It's not a fucking insult that Mexicans and Guatemalans are trying to get into our country. Right. Mm-hmm. It's it's probably the best thing that anybody could ever say about us. They, we want what you guys have. Yeah. Right. Not that we should give it to everybody. Right. Obviously we can't do that. And I think like, uh, like Milo says, it should be some, uh, mix between compassion and then what we need as a country bringing in. I, I agree with him completely on that. But anyways, uh, we have to set the standard. Like if you don't follow the rules, you get fucked up. You know what I mean? Well, here's, here's what happens. You're, you're, you're a case, a living case. So, yes, all right, great. You come in and uh, you try to enforce the rules. Right. Um, and what does your lawyer say 
in his cross then to b- back to this fucking prisoner. Everything that we said was either overruled or not allowed by the judge. And the Border Patrol is really hardcore because they don't support a lot of agents in anything that they do. Ironically, in my case, all my bosses testified on my behalf, which is something that's unheard of. Even to, the, to, to this day, I talk to agents and they tell me they stood up for you mm-hmm. because once, once you get into a courtroom and, you know, get into legalities, nobody wants to hear it. You know, and all my bosses said, if he's on trial for this, we should all be on trial for this. Yeah. We testified to that. He, actually, one of my bosses testified that I was a truthful agent and the government objected, says, well, he hasn't testified. We don't know if he's a truthful agent. You know, so they they and at the very end in closing arguments. But before I get to that, sure, they had a, they had the U.S. attorney. Mm. They had a lady there that was putting all these projections up on the uh, up on the on the wall. Um, they had the Mexican consulate sitting in the first pew so they can lean over and talk to him. And they brought in a civil rights trial lawyer from Washington, D.C. by the name of Brent Allen Gray. Okay. And this guy was good because during closing arguments for a split second, he had me convinced I was guilty. <laughs> <laughs> but during one of the breaks, it was, uh, it was right before Halloween because it was October 28th or 29th around the time. And, um, and we were in the restroom in the Austin Federal Courthouse. Mm. And uh, Brent Gay works for the uh, Department of Justice now, by the way. Does he? Yeah, yeah. Just look it up. Well, well, he he was a U.S. attorney back then. I think now he's a yeah. uh, he is a civil, prosecutor, criminal section. Yeah, he's a prosecutor in the in the civil rights division. Right. Well, that's that's what he. That's and what he's he an LSU to. graduate. So yeah, there you go. Well, there you so go. he anyway. comes into the <clears throat> restroom, and I'm using the restroom, and you know we got the stall. We're looking. I'm not peeking, right? <laughs> sure. <laughs> and uh, and he says Halloween in Texas. He, uh, Halloween in Austin, Texas. Asked me if I was going out. And I said, no, are you? And he says, no, I got a trial to win. And so I, do you really think I did this? You, you really think I'm guilty of this? He goes, doesn't matter what I think. He goes, I got a $50 million budget. Make sure you go to prison. And you're going to prison. It doesn't matter how long. Yeah, it's funny. That's, that's a good analog to the fact. We talked about it about two weeks ago, I think, on the show. There, uh, there are a, a handful of states, more than, you, more than should exist. Obviously, none should exist. But there are a handful of states in this country that have contracts with private prisons where they're required to keep a certain amount the of feds people. Do. Yeah. yeah. Federal government does too. Yeah. Geo. So, yeah. There's, I think the federal government, I think there's 30 federal facilities, if I'm not mistaken. I, I had to look that number up again, but I'm pretty sure there's 30 federal facilities that have contracts with private prison systems where they're required to keep a certain amount of people in prison all the time. Right. I mean, um, that, that is fucked. I, I understand. But uh, back to this, did, did you say to him at, like afterwards, like, um, I was I was speechless. Is, do you think he's, this is fair? He, like, he no. He he smiled at me and said, "See you in court," like that. And I just felt this bucket of warm water come over me. It felt like I was pissing my pants. I was like, I just, I felt like somebody dumped a bucket of warm water over me, Ross. And it was just unreal. Did you feel like you were fucked at that point? I like, knew it. You, you did. I knew it. You did. But I still had faith because the truth, mm-hmm. the truth. So so basically. Um, they, the, the ju- after five days, they deliberated for four hours. At one point, they wanted the cop, they wanted some uh, trial testimony. The judge denied it, says, no, you can remember what happened. It wasn't too long ago. And I got found guilty. And I'm sorry, the- he said it. you could remember it. It wasn't too long ago, like the, that part of the trial or the actual event? Uh, no, the, the trial, mm. because they wanted <clears throat> some trial testimony, some yeah, yeah. transcripts. Yeah, yeah. And the judge said no. Um, so w- when you say five days, uh, four hours, was it four hours a day for five days? No, no, no. Or? It was it was a four hour deliberation. Oh, that's it. Yeah. Oh, so after four hours, did they your lawyer did yeah. your lawyer lean over to you and say, "Hey, man, they got you." That, yeah. Like this well, is, you know, at, at that point, I'm sure you're asking, right? I actually thought I was going to get off of it because what did they have? Yeah. You know what did they have? They had a drug smuggler, and during closing arguments, during the closing arguments, the U.S. attorney came and, and spoke from the podium. To the jury. My lawyer came and spoke to the jury because you got 40 minutes. Yeah. So the U.S. attorney spoke for 20 minutes. My lawyer spoke for 40. And then this Brent Allen Gray guy grabbed the podium, walked in front of the jury and started preaching like it was a church choir. Sure. And that's, what, that's when I said at one point he had me convinced I was guilty. And he basically made uh, all my supervisors and everybody that, were, that had 20, 30 years in the Border Patrol look like liars. 
and made this trainee agent out to be the superhero, which is where all that documentation comes from. Well, he said he punched him, so it must have happened. And I got found guilty. And when they read the guilty verdict, the judge kind of looked up like that. Well, they gave it to the judge first and the judge kind of like kind of surprised. And then they read it. And the court, uh, the court stenographer, stenographer, she was like, she said like that. And there goes that bucket of warm water again. I didn't know what to feel. And uh, I almost jumped off the bridge at Congress that night. You know, Congress and uh, and, and yeah, yeah, Columbia yeah. River right yeah, yeah. there. <clears throat> um, now, now during this, do they tell you how many years you're going no. away for? No, there's so a whole other sentencing phase. Yeah, you get yeah. to go home. Yeah. So how long were you home for? <clears throat> Well, I, you were probably held in confinement for that time, right? No, uh, they, they wanted to take me in right there, yeah. but they, the judge left me out pending an appeal. I was actually out mm. for o- over a year because mm. the trial was in October 2002, and they didn't, I didn't lose the appeal until March 2004. So during that whole time, I was working. I, I moved to San Antonio. I was working, and I started getting my college degree and I'm uh, in emergency management because I was like, what else am I going to do? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I like saving people. I and like helping having people. a, having a CEM certified emergency manager, there's, there's 1600 of those in the world, by the way, it's a very mm-hmm. high paying job. So it's a smart move. So, so, and I went to the, uh, court of appeals and I can't remember the exact date, but it was late 2003. And, they had the three judges, and then once again, I thought, wow. I looked at the marble walls, the halls of justice, mm-hmm. and I thought, okay, this is going to be made right here. And from what I heard that day, I thought I was scot-free because the judges chewed the government's ass. Because they, they sent this girl, her name was Tova Calderon, Calderon, and she had a binder. And my attorney made the case, and they asked him some questions, and then they asked her something. And she was was going, it your same attorney from the Same trial? attorney, okay. yeah. yeah. The, the judge allowed me to have the same yeah, yeah. attorney. Normally you don't, yeah, yeah. but the judge allowed it. And uh, she was going through the case, and she kept, they asked her questions. She, she kept going through the binder, and they asked her, do you not know this case? She goes, no, I was handed this case. He goes, oh, so this is such an important case to the government that the prosecutors that started this case couldn't even be here for it. So they sent you. Yeah, they sent an associate who just probably got her degree. Right. Right. Come so I, I thought I had won. And they asked her a bunch of questions. <clears throat> and they said, is that all he did? But then th- three weeks later, they wrote the complete opposite of what they had said in court. And they upheld the decision. Well, why, that, why, why was that? It's, politi- no it's idea, political so. pressure. I mean, look, there, you, no idea. Obviously, there's no real point in speculating, but I'd like to do it because it's interesting. Uh, the fact that the Mexican consul was so involved probably means there was some other kind of deal going on at the time, and they just, for whatever reason, got hyped up about this case and wanted something to happen. Otherwise, this other thing that we were going to do for you is not going to happen. But why? Probably. Why a it's case always it, it, it minor? Is, it's like, always quid pro quo. It's yeah, always I, I, quid and pro quo. I understand that, but you you always hear about. Um, you know, border security and, and border <clears throat> patrol agents like shooting people and things like that. Why something this small and petty? Why spend the time, money, and energy into something like this? All I can say of what I know is I was a big drug catcher. I was a big narcotics buster. I, I stumbled upon it. I could, I could be walking down in the brush and trip over it and find it. Right. All right. Which probably means in real life, you're kind of a dirt bag because they always make the best ones, right? That's why the <laughs> DEA sucks by the way. Cause they, if you, if you on your paperwork for the DEA, if you, if they're like, Hey, have you ever done, have you ever, have you ever, do, do you drink more than three times a week? Do you, do you, you ever smoked weed in your life and you say yes to any of that shit? You're out. Like, right. how are we supposed to send guys that don't know what drugs look like to go find drug dealers? Right. That's why exactly. DEA, DEA stands for don't expect anything. Exactly. And the federal. I'm not even kidding. That's what most other agencies refer to it as. It's fucking bullshit. Anyway. So, so, so you think because of how many cases you fucking made that that's, they, they had some. It's the only thing I can think of because they were trying to appease Mexico. Now, mm. again, I looking back 20 years later. Uh, Some things happened before that that I didn't associate with it, and I can't prove anything. To you or to To me? Okay. To me. So this all started in January 2014 when I pushed this guy on the ground. Mm -hmm. Wait, 2014? 2001, I'm sorry. 2001. Yeah. January 14th. Yes, there it is. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I'm being confused for a second. in, In 2000, in October of 2000, I think it was, I was working the brush, and I got caught. I got called out to sector. Mm-hmm. Now, mind you, this is me thinking back of what could have been. Right. The chief wanted to see me. The chief of Del Rio sector, Paul Berg, wanted to see me. 
I'm like, I'm in the brush. It's going to take me three and a half hours to get there. And they said, stand by. They told me to start marching. So I ended up going to sector. Got to sector. They said, they're waiting for you. I was like, they? They were like, yes, they. So I go in there and it's the chief with two FBI agents. And I don't remember their names. Um, apparently, the Gulf Cartel had put a $2.5 million bounty on my head. Mm-hmm. And they wanted me to go work in Montana. It was October. I was like, Montana, it's cold up there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Well, can I go in Miami? Oh, no, we can't adequately protect you in Miami. I was right. like, adequately protect me? You said you've known about this for three weeks. I didn't see you marching behind me in the brush just now yeah, trying to protect sure. me. Yeah. So I asked the chief, I said, do I have to go? And they said, well, you don't have to do anything. So I said, nah, I'm good. Thanks. And that was it. That's all I ever heard about that. Six months later, I'm on trial. Now, is it connected? I don't know. I can't prove it. But that happened. Sure. Is it I, I, after all of this, right? Because that, that job is not high paying whatsoever. Why does anyone want to do this? Protect- Especially after hearing your story. Well, to me, it's the best job in the world. I would go back to, to mor- this day. I would go back tomorrow if they let me. Love no the, shit. <laughs> love that job. Love protecting the country. When I, here's the thing. I was in the Coast Guard. Mm-hmm. I tried three times to get into the Border Patrol. The first time was in like '92. And I got accepted, but Hurricane Andrew, I was stationed in Miami. Hurricane Andrew came through, wiped us out. I got transferred to Fort Lauderdale. I never got my acceptance letter. So the next time I tried was in, I think it was 96, and I got accepted, but they hadn't sent me the acceptance letter, and I had a wife and a kid, and I was, didn't know what to do, and I said, where's my letter? And they said, well, it's coming. We just haven't you know, officially done it yet. I mean, the federal government. So I ended up, re- I ended up extending for mm. two years. <clears throat> and then two weeks after my extension, I got my acceptance. You get your letter for Fletzy. Like, here you nope. go, buddy. Exactly. You're like, oh, thanks, we asshole. Report to San Diego. Yeah. Jesus Son Christ. of a bitch. So the third time, I got oh, discharged boy. from active duty on February 22nd, 1998. Mm-hmm. And I was in Del Rio, Texas, swearing in on February 23rd, Monday morning. And uh, to me, when I was working the border, when I first got on, I was like, I am the forefront of our country's mm. defense. I am right here on the line. Right. I loved it, bro. I loved it. Still love it to this day. I, all, most of my family and bros are, are Border Patrol agents. Yeah, right. look, Rocco, uh, one of our former co-hosts. He was at my yes, station. Yes, dude. Yeah. He, he talks <clears throat> about the love for it as well. And, uh, and I asked him the same question, which is why I asked you. Mm-hmm. I mean, it and seems he, like he, a very unique opportunity, really. Well, he just said the pride of the, the, the country and what it's like to be an American mm-hmm. and to protect a country, very similar to what you had yeah. said. First line of defense. Um, and I'm, I'm sure this is going through your mind as you're being sentenced. And then when they tell you how long you're going to prison for, what's your thought then? I knew I was going to prison. Um, Didn't know for how long. They were pushing for seven years. So I actually got the bottom. I I got the minimum, which is 27 months. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it hurt. It hurt after so many years of, you know, I was in the Coast Guard. I was a bosun's mate. So I drove rescue boats through Mm -hmm. the seas and through the surf and put my my life and my cruise lives on the line to save other people. And all of a sudden I'm going to prison. And two years in prison was just, we want to talk about a nightmare that never ends, Russ. <laughs> it, was, it was just can't crazy. I, yeah. I can't imagine, because not only that, but you, you go to prison in Texas, right? Where a lot of I these guys... In Texas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but a lot of these guys who are in prison uh, probably know that you're Border Patrol, mm-hmm. and they're yeah. like, fuck this guy. <clears throat> how, do I, how do I get him? So you had to have spent every waking second... Trying to stay alive. I didn't sleep for years. Yeah, and then try also like not sleeping and trying to figure out how why why am I in fucking prison right now for doing my goddamn job? You I know, mean, I w- I really wish like I like the body camera stuff now because and I and I like <clears throat> a lot of cops uh, in the country these days are posting videos and pictures of themselves interacting with the community right now, and they have because of social media laws and shit like that or laws with their departments and stuff they have to block out what agency they work for, and I get that stuff, but. If for every uh, uh, boot in the chest of a guy that's trying to get up off the ground and start a fight with you, if they showed every fucking meal one of these guys purchased for one of these people when they took their own food and water out and gave it to these people who are committing crimes, by the way, right? Mm-hmm. Like, this is my stuff for today, but I know you need it more than me. Here it is. Yeah. If for every one of those, uh, uh, that it's like a character witness, right? So the idea that, that uh, the guy can't, uh, you're, you're, 
your guy can't testify on your behalf before you speak in court. That's absolute fucking nonsense, I dude. I mean, that doesn't make any sense to me. If, and, and I've been that guy. I've Have I violated policy? Yeah, I did because I left illegal aliens unattended in my vehicle while I walked into the grocery store and got them water because yeah, they were exactly. thirsty. Yeah. You know? Did I let a kid out? Like, please do this shit all the time. If you're a cop out there and you're fucking... And you're, you're, you patrol an actual neighborhood, which I think community policing is so important because you get to know people and they respect you and you respect them. That's what this country is supposed to be exactly. about. This 14-year-old kid, he's got a fucking ounce of weed on him or some shit. I'm like, dude, at least try to hide this shit. Are you fucking kidding me? Like, do you know how many police officers go out of their way to not put people in fucking prison? Yeah. Like, honestly, yeah. dude, what the fuck? How, how long were you in jail before they figured out who you were and what you did? Oh, they knew, uh, they knew who I was oh, when yeah. I got there. Right away. Yeah, yeah. I mean... They uh, have a network. Yeah, these... Not, they have not, a whole not, network. not even just the criminals, but the fucking... Uh, this, the, the, the guards. The administration mm -hmm. in federal prison especially is not great. So I got picked up from home. They, they busted in my door, pushed my then 70-something-year-old mom on the ground. Wait, you had already been convicted. Why didn't they just call you and tell you to come there? I had already self-surrendered twice before. But all of a sudden, they decided they had to come kick in I my mean, door. If you had fucked somebody out of a billion dollars, they'd call you and be like, hey, can you come in on Wednesday? Right. Yeah. So they, they, they kicked in my door about 4.30 in the morning, uh, pushed my mom on the ground. They took me away. Uh, they put me in one of those contract prisons downtown yeah. San Antonio in a yeah. geo prison for three or four months. Then they put me on Con Air, sent me to the transfer center in Oklahoma City, which is right on the airport, which is, was a whole crazy experience right there. Now, was Nick Cage there? Or huh? John Cusack. I didn't see any of them, but but I heard they were there. Yeah, yeah he's yeah, probably the yeah. next plane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. next yeah. plane, next plane. And Danny Trejo was a friend of ours, <laughs> right back there on yeah, the fucking wall. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, wait. I met Danny. Yeah, yeah Danny's yeah. a great guy. Great guy. Anyways, yeah. So you go. You, so you, they send they send me to a low in Coleman, Florida, and I'm there for a few months, oof. and uh, I get I get jumped by the Mexican population because uh, they find out who I am. What do you mean? So when you when you say get jumped, they beat the shit out of you? Uh, they I, they I got jumped, but they didn't beat the shit out of me. I actually ended up splitting somebody's melon, and uh, I got transferred out. Got sent to the penitentiary in Atlanta, Castle Gray School. Oh, yeah. yeah, Jesus you, Christ! That's, that's is that a scary place? Or what? Worst, was? The worst of the worst. I mean, Look. they don't call it Castle Gray School because it's awesome. <laughs> Fuck, Dude. man! I, God I, damn! You just I mean, it kept just getting worse for you. Yeah. So how did you survive that? <sighs> well. Right in, when I was in that place, I was in solitary confinement. It's a, it's a high security, and I was in solitary confinement, and I was in a jail cell 23 hours a day, uh, 24 hours a day, except for Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, which would, they let us out for an hour to either use the phone or take a shower. Huh. Um, Wait, but so I was, you were taking three showers a week? Yes. Or they have that. Uh, or using a phone. It's an eight. It's a twelve by eighteen fenced in area for your outdoor time. No, nope, we didn't get the, Sometimes when you're in fucking federal prison, right? They, have an eight, they do that, but we didn't get that. It's twelve by eighteen. Like that. That's that's your your yard time is an eighteen by twelve. And then you gotta get strip fence. search on the way yeah, in and yeah. on the way out. But yeah. at that the penitentiary in Atlanta, we didn't have that. Really, Jesus. No, it, it was we were in our cell except for one hour on Monday, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, which we had a choice of either taking a shower or making a phone call, and. It was a cell made for two, and we were seven in there. So there was a guy on the top bunk, guy on the bottom bunk, guy underneath the bottom bunk, a uh, guy wrapped around the toilet, two on the mattress to the side, and I was wrapped around under the sink with my feet on the toilet with a, with a roll of toilet paper as a, as a pillow. For how long? Four months. For four months you were, you were in there. Yes. I mean, what's it like being in a cell with seven dudes like that? I can imagine you guys are fighting a lot or you're trying to stay alive. A little of both. Yeah, there was there was uh in this part they they come and go because everybody transfers. Mm, sure. And at one point there was five of us in there, and uh, I had gotten the bottom bunk, and there was one guy from Aruba, and he, I want I, I wanted to pound this guy. I never wanted to beat somebody so bad other than this guy because he was saying how he and his friends in Aruba used to take American girls and take them out on the boat and rape them for days. And he was bragging about it. Jesus and I Christ. tried I tried getting him fired up so many times. I cursed his mother. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but he wouldn't go. <clears throat> People like that are cowards, though. A man, a man, I mean, you know this from, from the work you've done in the past, but people that, uh, men that rape women are cowards. Uh, they are. Right? Yeah. They so are. They're never and gonna, this guy, never and this guy bragged about it. They'll never fight a man. And I told the, I told the warden, I said, you need to get me out of the cell because I'm going to hurt this guy. And they wouldn't. But then they transferred me out, and I went to the, uh, they sent, I finished out at the, at the uh, Yazoo City, Mississippi Federal Correction Center. 
Okay. So they sent me there, and that's where I finished well, out. Well, at least you got a nice tour of the southeast. Yeah, no right? kidding. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you didn't see much outside. outside right? Anyway, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when you get out, um, I imagine you know you got to start over. Uh, was your mom still alive? Were you yes, able to go back yeah. and, and see your mom? And I'm a, I'm actually taking care of my mom right now. She's 87 years old, and she's got bladder cancer, and I'm, uh, she lives with me now. Mm-hmm. Uh, that sucks, but she's her 87. Caretaker. That's a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. good for her. Yeah, yeah. She's, I, I don't I don't know if any of us are going to make it that long. <laughs> I, I hope I don't, yeah, man. She, and it sucks because she's such a strong woman because she traveled everywhere. Mm-hmm. She she went to New York City from Puerto Rico in 1950, and she's always been everywhere on the bus. Is everything. that where you guys are originally from? I'm from family? Brooklyn, yeah. Oh, no, from, from, from uh, your mom's from Puerto My Rico. My mom's from Puerto where Rico. Where in Puerto Rico is she from? From Ponce. Oh, shit. Yep. There you go. Ponce. 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 That's how it's, ta- it's, 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 you pronounce it taco, dummy. Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not taco. Yeah. That's why you buy, you buy all your stonks and ponce. Um, I actually try my best not to pronounce words in their, in the, in the language that they come, come from because I feel like an asshole doing that. Right. You know what I mean? Like, like Burvelde. Yeah, I can't. There's no way. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I would I sound, I would, it would sound so it. pandering if I was trying to do that. By the way, nobody, why, what's up with Texas and not naming or, or pronouncing words right? Like burn it. No, it's Burnett, motherfucker. Right. And everybody knows it. Yeah. And it's Bexar. Fuck. It's yeah. Bear. No, bear. I, I hate it. When when did your um fight for a pardon start then? Mm. Well, I've been always talking about a pardon, but Bush put me in prison. Obama wasn't gonna give me one. Mm-hmm. So no, once mean, look, President Trump yeah. once President yeah. Trump became <laughs> president, I was like, I've got to do this. So I got a friend in San Antonio who's a national uh, talk show host, Joe Pags. Yep. And uh, me and him have been a good friend. He's been a big advocate of mine from the get-go, known him for 15 years. He's got this guy on his show regularly called Lieutenant, Je- Lieutenant Colonel Jeffrey Atticott, mm. who's a professor of law at St. Mary's University and runs the uh, Warrior Defense Project. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. They took my case on pro bono and pushed my, pushed my pardon. The only people that have the ability to get stuff like that done are people that do it pro bono at this point, right. to be honest, because nobody's going to spend money on your ass. And I, I, know, uh, I know a lot of good people. Sarah Carter from <clears throat> Fox News, she's written <clears throat> stories on me. So I just had this big push, and once the pardon was actually filed, uh, everybody just pushed it out. And I actually, last year, last February, I started my own podcast, Gary Brugman Podcast. Mm-hmm. It's actually down right now at the request of some people, mm-hmm. um, but it's coming back up. But I started my own podcast just to reach out to the president because uh, I know Chris Tanto Peranto, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, and I've been on the Battle Line podcast, and I've been on several other radio shows, and I was like, you know, I get... This is actually one of the longest podcasts I've been on. But normally I get, you know, an hour, hour and a half, 20 minutes, I started my own podcast to reach out to the president. But after episode three, when I got done with my story, I was like, well, I'm just going to continue. I started having on guests and right. I got up to <laughs> 77 episodes and it became kind of therapy for me yeah, yeah. and I loved it. So I'm going to be starting that back up here soon. Good. Yeah, and it's important. It's important that you uh, find other people that share common ground on your story, because ultimately uh, we've all got to decide to be on the side of justice and against injustice. Exactly. Right? Regardless of who it happens to. And, and hearing stories from different, like hearing people hearing your story and realizing what can happen to somebody that has faithfully served their country, they could still get fucked over. It gives you a really good perspective on people that we know are disenfranchised already before they even get into the criminal justice system. You know what I mean? And like I said, then a lot of people don't know what it feels like to have the full power of the federal government come down on top of yeah. you. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a scary yeah. feeling, and they, they will try you until you're broke. I mean, it's taxes, right? So rich people can afford great CPAs, so they pay less percentage of tax, mm-hmm. right? We've created a system where you have to be wealthy and powerful to defend yourself against government intrusion into your life, and that is not in any way what this country is supposed to be. Right. All these people that serve 47 years, for example, or I guess 48 now mm-hmm. in the federal government, it was never intended to be that way. No, George sir. Washington was the first president of this country. And he got after at the end of his second term, he could have he let's be real. George Washington could have served for the rest of his goddamn life and nobody would have said shit about it. But he decided that that was long enough. Like, I'm going to go. I'm going to go back. Well, it was eight. But yeah, like four years at a time. I'm right, going to go. I'm going to go back home. And that's the end of it. And nobody after him even attempted until FDR. He gave the first pardon in 1795. Yeah, he did. Yeah. I, uh, look, I'm, <laughs> I've done this show for <clears throat> six years at this point. Um, now is obviously where we get to the drinking bro of the week. Um, for the first time ever, I, I have a feeling that I know who the drinking bro of the week is. It's gotta be 
It's got to be President, President Trump, right? Trump. Yeah, like, President Trump. There's no way he's going to change my mind I've on never, how great a president I, I, I he is. I was going to say, I've never guessed the, the person before. And this one, it was, yep. it, it was easy. There, 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 there's nobody else, man. The man has changed my life. Uh, it's such a great feeling. And, and, and like, like my buddy Scott knows, man, I've had this big smile on my mm. face. I'm wearing a free shirt because I'm free. Yeah. Veteran. I mean, veteran. that's, uh, that's, uh, that's Rocco's. Yeah, yeah Rocco. Rocco's. And then we've yep. got the uh, Sons, Sons of Liberty. Liberty. Gun Wars. Yep. They, did, they just gave me a rifle the other day. As oh, really? They were on the yeah. podcast last week. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, they were yeah. great. Yeah, yeah, Mike's a great dude. Yeah. Yeah. They're all great dudes. All yeah, great Mike's guys. a great guy. I was there yesterday, as a matter yeah. of fact. I was yeah. talking to Kyle. Yeah, yeah Kyle and Mike. Yep. Good dudes. Um, man. Good guns. Bro, too. thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is the first time I've ever been speechless. I, I've never heard a story like and, yours and before it, in my life. And like everything you've gone through is so horrific for a job that you voluntarily took to protect our country. And yet our country was the one that put you through all this fucking it's bullshit. Why, it's why that quote and the idea behind it is so important. First, they came for the socialists and I was in the socialist. So I didn't say anything. Right. You cannot allow injustice because it eventually is coming for you. Right. Yeah. Exactly. That's it. Somebody that doesn't like you will get into power eventually, and they're going to use that power against you. We cannot allow that to happen in this country. But to wait 20 years for justice and to go through, you know, uh, two and a half years in some of the worst hell holes in our country uh, and come out of it like a great fucking person. Uh, I'm trying to do my best, brother. Is, is amazing. For everybody. Because usually, shit, man, everybody's extremely bitter and rightfully so it would be easy to be angry piece of shit right now yeah to be honest. well be i can't say that i wasn't when i got out of, of course, prison yeah. sure i sure. mean we all go through that you know i mean when i got when i got mm-hmm. out of prison i was going to the rampage games in san antonio i wouldn't stand for the national anthem i was angry yeah you know and then i have a, a mentor in houston and between him and glenn beck and some other people raised some money and i started the tool business i had a Mac tool truck back mm-hmm. in 2008 mm-hmm and they started collecting money from across the country. I started getting letters from people. Across, here's $5, here's $20, here's $100. And writing me letters, sorry for what you went through. And I realized that it wasn't the people. It wasn't America that was wrong. Right. It was the government. And I love government. We need government. But it's the people in charge of government, kind of like what we're going through right now. Sure. You know, but there was one letter from a seven-year-old girl. She sent me a check for $7.62, and I still keep up with her on Facebook. She's a medical student in the University of Miami She's right now. She's a fan of AK-47s, apparently. <laughs> right? No, $7.62. That's, that's pretty yeah, funny. What, what was the significance of that? She said that she normally uh, has a lemonade stand for her dad's poker games in the basement, and she gives the money to the veterans. But her dad brought my name up, and she wrote me a letter. And she says, uh, she says I don't know why you don't have a happy life like I do, but I hope you can one day. And her name was Nicole Van Meer. And that letter got me. And since then, I can't say I'm not bitter, but I just let it all go and tried to make the best of myself that I could, Ross. You know, because you carry that chip on your shoulders. And like I said, I've, I've lived a, it hasn't been easy, but life is good. And everything's on God's time. You know, it took him 20 years. Yeah. But, you know, I'm a free man now. Man. Uh... This is one of the craziest stories we've ever had. And I show. told you at the beginning, you ain't going to believe how, I, how I, simple and, it is. And you were right. And, and I, before you came on the show today, I, we always say the same thing to the guests. Hey, let's not talk about any of the stories. Right. Let's you talk told about me that. it live on air so that way it's fresh and, and we can hear it. That way you're not regurgitating the same story. Right. And that was literally your exact words. You go, you're not going to believe this. And sure enough, I, I even after this hour and however long is over, I cannot believe it. Um, thank you for sharing your story today. And Thanks for having show, me, brother. man. This was Thanks for uh, everything. truly eye-opening. Um, where can everybody Thanks, find you on social yeah, media? I am uh, on Instagram. It's uh, Gary Brugman and Gary Brugman on Facebook. That's B R U G M A N, by the way, Correct. for you illiterates out there. Okay, B R U G M A N, and uh, I'll be bringing the podcast back and that, that Facebook and Instagram. That's where I'm at. Well, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you to President Trump for pardoning this. Thank man. you, President Trump. You've yeah. changed my life. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, For D'Anthony, D'Anthony Holloway, I am Ross Patterson. This is the Drinking Bros. Good night, everybody.